we're very grateful to have uh, David Devereaux here. I'm sure a well-kent face to many of you. Um, and also Claire uh, Williamson from Rathmell Archaeology to uh, provide um, some more technical backup on both fronts. So I think um, I'm going to spotlight David in a minute, but just to introduce him briefly, um, David began his career in field archaeology in Bedfordshire in Southampton. Um, after undertaking archaeological research at Bradford University, he moved into museum work in 1983. Well, he was the curator of the Stewartry Museum in Kukubri from 1990 until 2013, so I think many of you local people will know him from that. And then since retiring in 2013, as ever, retirement always the busiest phase of life, really. Uh, he's been involved in several excavation projects within the region. Um, and I should also say that he's on the steering group for Can You Dig It? along with Andy Nicholson, the regional archaeologist and um, representatives from Historic Environment Scotland. So we've been very grateful to David over the last two years. He gives up his time very generously for free to support us and make sure that the project's going in the right direction. So uh, I'm going to hand over to David. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, well, if, if you were to say to me, uh, take me to Tundra Abbey, um, I can hear, and uh, what we're looking at, in fact, at the the old parish church at Tongland, built about 1633. And, uh, but within the structure, there is uh, a fragment of uh, a wall belonging to Tongland Abbey. So it's a wall that's been reused and you can see it's, uh, you can, you, on the left, you can see the uh, a photograph from the inside of the ruin of the church. And you can see the, um, the wall, uh, highlighted there with a with a plinth towards its base suggesting that this is a an outside wall of the of the former structure the abbey structure and on the right hand side you can see the the outside of the abbey and we've got uh, a medieval doorway probably 13th century to its left but it looks as if that medieval doorway has in fact been um, uh, reused and um, possibly turned around in fact um, because again that sort of taken at uh, face value it looks like that's an outside uh, as well doesn't it as it would be for the church for the parish church yeah. um so that that is tongland abbey as it stands and um really it's always been something of a a challenge something of a mystery to well establish establish what the layout of the abbey was originally and so on and uh, how big was it and so on and so forth. We, we will talk about something of the known history of it, but uh, first of all, let's look at the location mm -hmm. just to of the site so yeah. we can put that in a geographical context. And uh, a lot of local people will, I'm sure, know the site, but Tunglan lies just to the north uh, of Kukubri and it's, uh, it's on the River Dee and uh, it looks a fair way inland, but in fact, the, the River Dee is nav navigable as far as the, the Telford Bridge at Tongland. So almost within three, four hundred yards of the Abbey site, in fact, um, which is probably an important consideration um, when you when we understand that the uh, the first uh, canons, the Premonstratensian canons to to uh, to to come to the Abbey were from Caucasan near Lancaster and uh, quite probably rather than come overland they would have come by sea. Their abbey Caucasan was right on the coast uh, on the side of Morecambe Bay and it would, would have been far easier for them to travel by by sea um, across the uh, up the Irish Sea across the Solway and up the Dee almost to as I say within three four hundred uh, yards of, of the, the Abbey site mm. to be. And uh, next slide please, Helen. Yeah, it's a different location when you think of it, uh, when you think of it as water travel, isn't it? Rather than yeah. Water travel. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I mentioned that um, we, we know a little bit of the history of the site. We know that uh, it was founded by Alan Lord of Galloway in 1218 and that he brought um, canons. Now, so I'm, I'm, I'm using the word canons rather than monks. Um, canons were ordained uh, priests, so they would actually, uh, rather than being a closed order living within the abbey, like the Cistercians, for example, 
they actually went out into the community and provided uh, you know, spiritual services, spiritual support for the community. Um, hence, they were they are canons in that sense. Sometimes also known as the uh, the white canons because of the the white colour of their their their, um, their garb, um, and they provided services uh, and were responsible for, for five parish churches in the region, uh, as far west as Minigaf, for example, but also uh, Senek, uh, further down the Dee, um, and Barncrosh, probably within Tonglin Parish itself. Um, almost certainly the, um, the abbey continued in existence into the later 16th century, after the uh, Reformation in Scotland. Um, but uh, I'm particularly interested in the, if you like, the ruin of the abbey, and we can we can look at some of the earlier accounts, uh, historical accounts, where we're told, for example, by Andrew Simpson, writing 1684, that the the steeple and part of the walls are yet standing at that time. And then a hundred years later, there was still something to see. Its its north wall is part of the priory. That's what we've looked at already. The uh, the north wall of the parish church is being referred to here. Um, so that's uh, the first um, reference to that uh, that particular feature. Um, but importantly, it also uh, this this account in 1792 also tells us that the the ruins of the priory were contiguous to the church, so they must have been visible, um, you know, around the church. And that was obviously an important clue if we were to start looking for any further remains apart from that standing north wall. But within about 30 years, we're told that um, uh, the, in 1824, the house had been of considerable extent, but the country people having undermined the building for freestone, the whole fell into ruins. Um, so it's what's happened here has happened to most of our abbeys to a greater or lesser extent and in, in Tonglin's case to a greater extent the uh, the, the, the abbey was a good source of, uh, of building stone and uh, was in today's parlance essentially recycled there was a lot of building work going around on around Tonglin at this uh, around the turn of the uh, 18th 19th century there were new mills built down by the river, a new bridge was built across the river, and there was a new building going on in the in the Clachan or the, the village of, of Tunglin itself. And you can still see uh, worked architectural workstone uh, you know in, in these structures round about. So that's really what's happened to the ruin. It's been well well picked over, well recycled for its building stone. There we go. Yeah so looking at the site from the air um, we're looking at the, in roughly in the center of that uh, red circle we're looking at the uh, the larger roofless rectangle is the the later parish church of 1813 but just to the left of that uh, of that um, on the fringe of the trees is the this is the parish church we were looking at so if we remember that account from what 1792 that the the abbey ruins or contiguous with the parish church then this really is the area that we have to look in for that. Um, there's a churchyard in the sort of northern half of that circle obviously that's going to be a little bit tricky to carry out any survey work any geophysical work or any excavation work it's uh, really impossible to do it there but to this in the southern part of the circle if you like in the where all the trees are uh, that's in fact the garden of the former manse, the church manse, which you can see um, at sort of the seven o'clock uh, part of the of the circle, if you like. There, uh, you see the roof of the manse with of, of the manse there, and um, the uh, owner, Mrs. Suzanne Powell, has very been very supportive of the project that we've been un undertaking for the last uh, six years, really and uh, that's included both a geophysical survey of the garden and subsequent trial trenching uh, of the of a garden as well but just before we go uh, we look at the site in detail um, let's remember that um, Tunglin was one of a, a number of uh, abbeys and monastic sites strung across the uh, Dumfries and Galloway and the borders we're I think very much aware of the uh, concentration 
the border abbeys, uh, Melrose, Dryborough, Jedburgh, etc., um, in the border region, uh, and we can see those on the uh, on the on the plan there. I've highlighted Dryborough in particular because that was also um, a house of the same Premonstratensian order, the same white canons that uh, were uh, that uh, when, were in Tungland. Um, they were colonised, if you like, from Annick across across the border in, into England, Northumberland. Um, but looking into Dumfries and Galloway, we can also see four Premonstratensian houses in our in our area. Tungland, of course, but uh, starting from the in the west, we have Stallseat, uh, just to uh, just to the west of Glenluce. Whithorn was latterly a Premonstratensian house. And over just to the north of, of Dumfries, um, in the Nith Valley, we have Holywood or De Connell, um, which was also uh, Premonstratensian. And uh, I've put Cocker Sand in the sea rather there, just to indicate that, uh, yes, go down the coast as far as uh, Morecambe Bay and you'll, you'll find where our cannons came from. Mm -hmm. Could also mention that across in, in Cumbria, we have Shap, also Premonstratensian house. But you can see there are four Promenstratensian houses and, and uh, three Cistercian houses uh, within Dumfries Galloway. Glenluce, which we'll look at in some detail later to compare the, that site with Tongland. And of course Dundrennan, the, perhaps the largest abbey we have in the area. And Sweetheart, which was um, colonised or founded from Dundrennan. Um, New Abbey, uh, hence its name, New Abbey, rather than the Old Abbey, reference to Dundrun and the Old Abbey. Mm. So I mentioned uh, Glenluce there, and um, this is Glenluce today, taken from the north. So we're looking across the, in the foreground, we're looking at the uh, rather low walls of the, uh, of the, of the Abbey Church, mm -hmm. which uh, haven't survived too well, apart from the um, uh, East Transept, which you can see the tallest surviving part of the structure there. Um, and to the right of that, you can see walls relating to the, the cloister area, uh, which where the uh, main accommodation was for the, for the monks, where they slept and met and ate, etc., and kept their stores and, and that sort of thing. And if we look at the next slide, we can see um, that um, Glenluce uh, follows a fairly typical, well, a very typical plan for uh, monastic houses at this time. There's slight variations between uh, in, in the forms or the layouts of houses between different orders, but uh, the normal thing is to have the abbey church um, on the north side of the main complex, um, as we can see here, aligned uh, east, east-west, and then to the south of that, the sunny side, if you like, of the of the site we have the cloister garth or the cloister yard the square there and around the uh, cloister area are usually the east range it's very important we've got the um, chapter house where the uh, community would have a, a daily meeting to to discuss business and organize their affairs sleeping accommodation was probably above um, that range and then to the south, you have um, usually the refectory, the eating area, the kitchens, uh, the toilet block. And uh, one normally finds a water supply coming into that south range. You need that for a variety of functions from the kitchens through to the, through to the latrines or the necessarium, as it was called. And then on the west side, you have um, uh, stores, you have accommodation for travellers, visitors, you might have accommodation for the abbot in some as well. Um, so that's a pretty typical monastic plan, the sort of thing we might expect to, to find at, at Tongland as well. Um, and uh, that's really the background, Helen, to uh, yeah. the project before we started. Yeah, fabulous. So knowing that and, and obviously being of interest, how, how did the project get started? What actually prompted all the work in the first place? Well, funnily enough, it's all to do with Magna Carta. <laughs> and uh, I'll have to explain that, won't I? Mm -hmm. um, in uh, the year uh, yes, 2015, of course, marked the 800th anniversary 
of the signing of, uh, of, of the Magna Carta. And um, there was a Magna, Magna Carta uh, group committee set up, Magna Carta 800, as it was called, uh, to uh, which um, oversaw a variety of events to celebrate and mark the occasion of, uh, of the signing of Magna Carta. And uh, there, were, there were funds available for projects to take place across the country. And um, you could say, well, what's, what's, Tunland's, what's Tunland's connection with that? Mm -hmm. Well, there are two Scotsmen named on Magna Carta. One was King Alexander II, and the other was Alan, Lord of Galloway, because uh, Alan was really a very important figure, not just in Scottish uh, politics at the time, but certainly across the uh, British Isles. And he was constable of the Scottish Army, so he was commander in chief of the Scottish Army. He had lands in England. He also had the command of a sizable uh, fleet and provided shipping for King John, for example, to invade Ireland. So he was a major figure on the, on the British stage, if you like, at this time. And so, so Alan is linked to um, Magna Carta in that way. He was also sort of a background advisor uh, in the negotiations to both Alexander and I think to some extent to John as well, King John as well. So uh, uh, quite an important figure in that. And of course, he is the man who three years later founded Tungland Abbey. Yeah. Now, the initiative for this uh, came from uh, Donald Henry, uh, who, working with the Tungland and Ringford Community Council, put a bid in to the Magna Carta 800 committee, and uh, it was successful. I think it may possibly have been may possibly have been the only bid actually from Scotland. Yeah. You tend to think of Magna Carta being a, a sort of English thing, but in fact, you know, there was uh, demonstrably a, a Scottish connection here, and the bid was successful. the The project which was put forward for Tungland uh, had several parts. One of which was the production of an information leaflet to explain the connection between Alan, Tungland Abbey and Magna Carta. And uh, another element of the project was the production and the manufacture of a, an information panel, which you can see still in, in, in the churchyard at Tungland. Um, and here we see uh, the unveiling ceremony with Tom Pitcairn, then chairman of the Community Council on the left, and uh, Sandy McCulloch, doing the unveiling. He was the, the deputy uh, Lord Lieutenant at the time. So we had a, a very fine occasion, lovely occasion on a, on a lovely summer's day uh, in the churchyard for that um, unveiling. Excellent. And, if, and uh, we can home in, I think we can see the, the, the illustration on the panel. Is, uh, it's a uh, central illustration of a uh, artist's impression of how the Abbey might have looked. This has been drawn by uh, my uh, colleague uh, John Picken, former curator of, uh, of Stranraer Art Museum, and uh, based on the information, fairly limited information we were able to give John, um, this is the the best guess, if you like, at the time as to what the uh, Abbey might have looked like. And we can see um, on the left, or sorry, on the right, we can see the River Dee, and there's quite a steep slope down to the River Dee, and um, on that, on the left bank, we could obviously the main complex, the Abbey Church uh, and the cloister area. Um, we, we do know from later accounts that the steeple was particularly tall, and so it's got quite a large steeple. It must have, when it was standing, and, and I think Simpson tells us it was still standing in 1684, um, it was, I think, thought to be the tallest, tallest spire in in Galloway, and it must have been a magnificent uh, landmark, sort of rising mm. out of the bottom of the valley, of the Dee Valley there. Mm. Um, beautiful. Another medieval treasure we've lost, unfortunately, mm. but um, there we are. Um, and then around the complex, we've got, a, we've got a, a wall. You can see a wall going around the whole site and closing out the site. That wasn't an original feature. It was added in the, I think, the 1430s by Abbot Harris. Uh, so we had a precinct wall. You can still see a, a good example of a precinct wall around Sweetheart Abbey. And uh, we've got a little gatehouse drawn um, 
in in the wall giving out the main axis coming in there so yeah that's um very much inspired if the, the reconstruction is rather inspired by glenn loose uh with the arrangement of the um uh, the east range with the chapter house etc and the south range with its, its kitchen and refectory and then it's got a west range there as well um so that was the two elements interpretation a leaflet a uh, an information panel for an information panel but uh, another element in the project was uh, a little bit of uh, funding for research to carry out a geophys geophysical survey of the uh, garden of of the former manse mansewood and uh, this was carried out by dr richard jones of glasgow university in 2000, uh, 2015 and this is the result of his resistivity survey you see the gray area in covering most of the garden where as you can see just to the south of the old parish church and the 1813 parish church and um, unfortunately the results weren't too clear as you can see we were hoping that you know the layout of the of the of the abbey in this part would leap out at us we would see foundation walls going across the lawn and all would be revealed but unfortunately not quite the case there is a clear feature uh, at the south end yes that one there but um, on uh, on excavation later on it turned out to be probably a um, the foundation a fairly broad foundation two and a half meters wide for a uh, a road um, and if you look at the look at the uh, resistivity you can see you can it's very very strong signal of extreme south and it's there's a sort of a thinning signal uh, going bending up towards the left that's it yes that's right Helen. <laughs> and um, there is a plan of about 1794 by John Galone. Uh, it's really a plan of the the fishery, the Tungland fishery, but it does show a road coming up from the Tungland Bridge, the 1724 Tungland Bridge, coming up this way, looping around the parish church on its way to the mills. And I think, I suspect, I'm not entirely sure yet, but I think that was what that may be. So no luck there with the Abbey. Uh, there's various areas of high resistivity and low resistivity, but not, nothing very clear um, leaping out at us uh, from the geophysics. So um, that was 2015 finished and we were not really any further forward um, <laughs> with the uh, understanding the either the, 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 the layout or the size of the, the, the main uh, abbey complex um, or its, its location you know, within the, the general area that we, we know it must be. But uh, unfortunately, geophysics didn't do that for us. Um, so we decided to continue the work, but by putting uh, trial trenches around the garden but essentially starting um, fairly close to the old parish church, working on the information we had that the, you know, back in the uh, 1800 or so, that you could, you could still see remains of the old church, of, of the abbey around the old parish church site. So that the north end of the garden seemed to be the right place to start putting some trial trenches. Yeah. And this and was your back. This was your background in archaeology that gave you the confidence to uh, to think. Right, I'm just going to take this a step further. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, um, yep. Yeah. Um, so putting into play my you know my archaeological experience and skills, um, we opted to undertake some trial trenching within the the yellow square, which you can see in the aerial view in front of you, and. Um, since we've, we've been carrying out trial trenching really since 2016. And in fact, we're, we're, we've restarted uh, with a delay for the uh, uh, COVID-19, of course, but we restarted this season. We just work one day a week um, and we have a dedicated band of, of uh, volunteers, uh, or local volunteers who help and uh, as I say, we have tremendous support from uh, Mrs. Powell at, uh, at Mansford, 
to who puts up with her sticking up her garden basically at the north end of her garden and we've received um, great support also from a number of funding bodies but particularly the uh, Hunter Archaeological and History Trust based in Falkirk uh, who uh, I think every year have provided support for the excavation. We we are all volunteers so we don't take any uh, the, 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 there's no um, no no labour costs apart from uh, travel expenses, so but we do need money for um, hire of a of a of a digger, mechanical digger, and of course for equipment, stationary consumables if you like, tools, fencing, um, and so on and forth and so forth. And uh, as I say, we've concentrated our, our area, uh, our, our work in that yellow area, the north, covering the north end of the garden essentially yes yeah, so i'll i'll run through um some of what we what we found so we're, we're going to look at a number of uh, similar pictures of trial trenches and i should say that i use the word trial um properly because we are not really we're not resourced enough to carry out um, full excavation of the site what we're what our objective is is to really expose what was left after the last demolition of the abbey so when we come down for example onto wall foundations we stop there we don't we don't dig on we don't look for earlier phases uh, of the structure because over 300 years you know from from 1218 to well at least 1518 if not longer uh, the abbey would have gone through a number of um, structural changes, re re you know, reorganisation of the layouts, etc. We're just interested in trying to establish where the um, where the main complex was. So when we come down onto um, medieval archaeology in the form, principally of uh, foundations, we stop there. We 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 we're just keen to recover as much as the plan of, of the site as we can. And if we get a big enough uh, section, a big enough piece of the jigsaw, if you like, you know, given that Abbey plans tend to follow a common uh, pattern, uh, we might be able to extrapolate from what we found and um, have a pretty good understanding of where, you know, the, what the rest of the layout of the site should be. I guess that's, here, that's kind of a key point, is it, to be really clear on your objectives? Uh, and know know what you're looking for and, and focus on that yes yes i think given um given given our resources as i say we're we're um we're not fully equipped for full-scale excavation and there's no need for full-scale excavation this is not a site that's threatened by development or anything like that you know the archaeology is going to be uh there in in future we're just really taking off the um uh, the soil and the overburden covering the archaeology uh, to recover the last plan of the site, but that that will surely give us a, a very strong clue as to the um, you know the regional uh, layout of the of the abbey. Mm -hmm. um, and here's uh, here's one of our volunteer vol volunteers. This is Roger, who's uh, traveling over um, cleaning up the a trial trench um, after the um, machine is. is dug the initial topsoil out. That's the same trench and um, <clears throat> it, it's become clear as to why the geophysics wasn't very helpful because we now know that the north end of the site was, has been landscaped. Originally, well only perhaps up to the 1930s, it seems that there's a large hollow in the north end of the garden and in fact, if you look at the, if you stand in the churchyard, you can see that that difference in level. The churchyard is lower than the uh, the adjacent manse garden, and that hollow has been filled in with uh, redeposited natural subsoil, which I've highlighted there. It's it's got rubble. It's got uh, uh, looks like glacial till, uh, some clay, some sand, um, and that's been dumped onto the former topsoil which effectively covers the base of the trench um, as cleaned up by Roger as you can see here. So, so we're looking at the former ground surface there, perhaps as I say 1930s ground surface. Uh, we've got a big lump of concrete in the corner of the trench, the far corner of the trench, um, which is, um, has got a square 
hole in it and in fact that was a, a, a base for a tennis court net post <laughs> and we found uh, two pairs of these so we've got uh, uh, quite possibly the landscaping was done to to put in a tennis court two tennis courts and there are people still living who play tennis on the, on these courts so we we're right up to date we've got oral history for the last use of the site after the after the abuse if you like and that yeah. was as a tennis court fabulous uh, yeah but as i say that that really uh, the importance of this trench was really to show that uh, we we have a better understanding of the depositional history over this part of the garden that that explains why you know geophysics yeah. didn't work for us here yeah and and never would have done in hindsight i never would have done it. i think with all the rubble in that you know you'd have to go and the thing is it gets deeper as you go north towards the parish church and it gets to be actually practically a little bit dangerous to dig because it's very it's very unstable in places uh you know we're looking at a fairly stable sort of clay and rubble uh dump there but in places it's just pure loose rubble mm. uh which which can collapse um it can get up to a depth of one one and a half two meters um and uh you you need to dig deeper in unstable ground it just gets a little bit too dangerous and we mm -hmm. you know you'd have to excavate a big much bigger area than, than than we can do to look at the whole plan in one go if you like you yes. know, it, yeah it's just we, we can get the answers we think you know this way or we can we get close to the the answers this way uh the next few slides helen we'll we'll look mm -hmm. at uh, what's coming up in some of the other trenches and uh, this for example was the first wall foundation we found and you can see it's a uh, it's actually a partly an L shape there's some see the little red lines in the bottom of the trench there those are just to indicate uh, a, so we've got a corner we're looking at a corner in the foreground and we think this is um, this was a little a foundation for a, a a porch or an entry into the cloister area as we'll see later when I show you the the composite plan um, that's a major one 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 the major feature that we've come across is a is a is a very uh, broad well-built uh, north-south wall foundation uh, this stretch is about uh, just under a meter wide but uh, further to the north it actually winds out to uh, 1.3 1.3 uh, uh, meters so we're talking about major major load bearing walls here so yeah. we must imagine um you know structures of um i don't know three four five meters something like that quite quite high structures requiring requiring these foundations it always strikes me the the cost involved in all of this as well you've got a large block of stone in the foreground there is is uh, porphyrite uh, which you can still well it's been quarried up until recently at Tungland Quarry uh, just above the site just to the um, uh, north uh, northwest of the site so this is local stone that's had to be quarried brought down to the site uh, not very good to not very handy to shape but uh, big solid blocks ideal for foundation and uh, here we can see Vivian in the background Sheila in the foreground uh, we've we've got uh, working on the again that, that same north-south wall foundation coming down to a corner in fact um just to the left of the the step ladder um and that, that large stone there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That one there which we call sheila's stone <laughs> i think she'd have found it um and then in front of just in front of that we've got a linear feature can you see a linear feature oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, not fully excavated but this is a this is a channel it's uh we think it's the uh, water supply channel coming into the site so the all important water supply um you know with some of these abbeys if you find the water supply everything everything um follows from that i mean that was that would be one of the first considerations uh, in building an abbey or a, a priory where's the water coming from and how do we get it into the site mm -hmm. and so on uh, mm -hmm. next slide i think we can see more of that channel oh yes there you go that's uh not fully excavated because the top the top of the fill is seems to be largely um demolition material again from the 
the, the demolition of the, mid, of, of the Abbey in the course of the 18th and into the early 19th century. You've got the cornerstones I've talked about on the left then, mm -hmm. uh, but you can see the, the, um, the channel with the, um, with the range rod in it just there, so on. So partially excavated to just to really to establish the form of the channel. It, it's roughly lined, as you can see, uh, stonework uh, to the right of the uh, range rod. And mm. on the next slide. Elaine's just asked, I noticed whether you found any piping or anything. You didn't, you didn't uh, see it. No, uh, nothing yet. Uh, we, may, we may not have gone deep enough. Uh, there, there is, uh, she's perhaps thinking of Glen Luce, where there's mm, a very elaborate yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, pipe system. Um, haven't seen any of that here, not even any fragments to suggest that. Um, here we're looking at uh, a couple of trenches. Um, again, we can, uh, we've got uh, one of our volunteers, Paul, on the right there. Um, and we've got uh, Jenny uh, in the trench itself. And Jenny's actually standing in the, um, in the, in the um, water channel, coming through from previous exposure uh, of it in that, mm. that trench there where, where Paul is mm -hmm. um, and in fact we can still see the the tennis court uh, net base oh yes which is sort of partly over there over the water channel line so it's heading it's heading uh, it's going from the uh, west in the right to east it's heading downhill and the river of course the river D is is uh, further down it's going to drain down into the River Dee uh, to the to the left to the to the east here, um, and uh, I think we've got some. Yeah, this is this is this was particularly interesting. This is getting towards the um, towards the north end, the the very north end of the garden. Where, as I say, the um, uh, the depth of the overburden the infill. Uh, is 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 much deeper, and you can see here we've got a trench within a trench. Really, mm -hmm. for safety reasons, we've um, we've excavated down to the um, the buried topsoil. So that's it. That's there, left and right. And then, because we've got unstable sides, as you can see on the right hand side, particularly rubble sides, we've dug within the trench, um, and um, we've come down onto a very heavily robbed wall going from the uh, far section coming down. They've left a couple of blocks in. I, I, I suspect that they've, these two blocks were just too big for the stone robbers to, uh, to heave out. So they decided that it wasn't worth back, breaking their back, backs to heave these two particular stones out. But of course, fortunately, when they, they'll leave traces of the robbing uh, in hoiking stones out. And in fact, on the on the left there, we can see um, um, we've seen this in one other trench, but this is the best exposure. We've got some evidence for flooring. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at the flooring of what we think is a monastic building. It takes the form here of a very weathered sandstone. Uh, but on top of the sandstone, there's a skim of mortar. So um, as I say, I think I think we're actually down into the, uh, the floor of a, a monastic building building here. But looking at the far section here again you can see the modern topsoil at the top and then the lighter brown uh, infill, the landscaping, coming down onto the buried topsoil which appears as a about you know three three to five centimeters, two inch, three inch thickness of very fine, uh, it's turf actually, it's, it's a buried turf line so it's a very fine stone free soil Mm -hmm. uh, which is a great, a great profile, a great, a great horizon to work to. When, you, when we get down to that, we know, you know, archaeology begins here. And you can see, you can see how close to the to that former topsoil the um, the the wall foundations were. So um, you know, when some of the early accounts are saying that they can still see traces of the abbey round about, and it's obviously quite extensive, you know, they could probably see bits of wall still sticking through the turf, mm -hmm. or even on a in on a um, in in summer, if if uh, you know there was grassland, then they would see parch marks, etc. Yes. There as well. Yeah. Yes. This trench was placed to pick up a uh, another north south wall, which we uh, we picked up to the north in a trench to the north last year. It was just a hint of a turn, but sure enough, yeah, there again, we've he's actually standing on. The remnants of foundation we can still see a couple of well in the section you can see a large block of this 
pinkish uh, red uh, porphyrite. Um, but then you've got windstone and then you've got leveling layers of, of mortar to give a nice, uh, a nice flat bed for, for, for building, uh, building up the wall subsequently. Um, and that's again underneath the, first of all, the, 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 the dumped rubble covering the buried topsoil, which you can see there. And then under the buried topsoil, there's this demolition material, there's soil and stone with a lot of mortar flecks in it. You know, this is, there's, there's obviously when you knock down a building, you create a lot of dust and, and rubble and mortar. It's a shell mortar they're using, but there's a lot of, um, uh, it's characterized by being a very loose in fill and, uh, and, and full of little bits of mortar. Mm. Um, and and it's just, so, so deep there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And in fact, just just this week uh, on Tuesday, we we pulled out a, a coin probably of George the Second, so we're in the early nineteenth century in that demolition layer. So that it, it it confirms that you know the abbey was still being plundered, or foundations were being plundered in, into the early nineteenth century. Mm. But um, but you know for us that's great. We've got the wall. We we can plot that wall and. Uh, um, I can now show you, I think, in the next slide. I was going to say, so five, five years' work. <laughs> five years' work has produced this, yeah, this jigsaw piece, if you, if you like. And uh, there again, we can see particularly this, this north-south wall feature. As I say, it's, it's very wide in the, yes, that stretch, and then it, it narrows a bit towards the bottom of the image there. Um, I've put that in relation to the existing old parish church wall in the north there you can see the uh, you know the bit of the abbey that's still standing so that's up there um and then um down further down we've got uh to the a little that that structure that porch or entry which i mentioned mm. that's that one there yeah um then we have a what's becoming a rectangular room Mm. in what might be the south um, range of the cloister area. So if I'm saying that, that means that the area between that, that room or the, yeah, that's it, that wall and the old parish church wall, mm. um, could this be the cloister area in here? Mm -hmm. It's about 20 metres from that south wall to the par old parish church wall which is it's comparable with Glen Luce and uh, for example Glen Luce I think is about 25 26 meters square cloister area this would be about 20 so it's sort of 75 percent 80 percent smaller than mm. Glen Luce but um, you know it, in fact it compares more with Cockersand the cloister area at Cockersand where these cannons came from and it quite possibly if they had any say in the planning and the layout of the area, they might say, well, we, we'll, we'll just recreate what we're familiar with back home, you know, back in Cockersan, where we've come from. Yeah. It, it, that was, may have been their template. Mm. And then very, the very bottom on that uh, plan, we can see the water channel mm. uh, coming through there. So we've got, uh, we've got four or five distinct elements there just to play with. And then I think if we, the next slide, if we compare this with, um, Glen Luce. Um, well, there's the Glen Luce plan on the right. Where does what we have, the fragment we have from Tungland, the jigsaw piece we have from Tungland, where does that go? And um, I think, well, the only one, the, the best fit I can see, but you know, we're, we're still, uh, we're still, the jury's still out on this. We're still finding, um, we're still digging. Um, but it looks as if we may be. Um, in the uh, West Range area, yeah, that bit there. Particularly, look how similar those little, um, Glen Luce had a little porch into the West Range, and we've got one uh, in roughly the same position. Yeah. So I presume at Glen Luce, this would, this would save you going through the Abbey Church, the big West doors of the Abbey Church, uh, save you going through the Abbey Church into the cloister area. This is a sort of the, uh, the back door, if you like, into the yeah. cloister, little okay. entry there. Okay. And then notice also they've got a they've got a what they call a kitchen. Uh, that's it there, which is you know again roughly where our rectangular room is. It's a similar size as well. And although the water well we haven't got the water supply on 
uh, shown on the Glen Luce plan, but uh, we, you know, you'd expect the water supply to be going through the kitchen area as we have, as we seem to have found at uh, Tungland. Yeah. But that, that's, that's Glen Luce, that's the Cistercian house. Let's have a look at the um, uh, Premon Stratensian house by going to Drybra, there it is. Mm. Lovely site, well worth a visit. Uh, beautiful. beautiful location. Yeah. Um, about the same size as uh, as Glen Luce. Um, if we look at the next slide, Helen, I think we're. Yeah, we see a plan. Um, and um, interestingly, at Glen at uh, Dryborough, mm. um, they don't have a West Range. There's a later oh, yeah. partial West Range added mm. in the in the 16th century, but that wasn't part of the original plan. Um, and they just have this west wall. They don't have a west range originally. They just have a west wall. Um, now it looks we've, as I say, we just have this broad west wall. We've got no indication of a of a parallel uh, wall to its right on the plan there, so to suggest that there's a range as they have at Glen Luce. Um, whether this is a an aspect of premonstratensian houses that they don't always have a west range you know did did they not need the accommodation for visitors did they not need the storage and so on or, or was it simply a question they couldn't afford it i think there's a suggestion at drybra mm -hmm. um, that in fact it was probably planned and you've got a rather truncated nave in the church but they just didn't get it done for um, one reason or another yeah um we can look at uh, look and again at the uh, at Dryborough. You don't have a little porch, but you do have an entry going into the cloister in that corner. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and again, in the south range is occupied by the refectory, the eating area, and somewhere in there, presumably the kitchen as well. Let's have a look at um, photographs. Some photographs from Dryborough next. So that's the corner. That's the west wall in the left hand side of the picture. So that's just a wall, there's no, there's no um, range itself. There's a big tall wall. Um, and then you've got, the, um, you've got the gable of the south range. So, uh, you know, you'd have a, an upper area uh, to that as well. And if we look at the next slide, we're actually, we're outside the corner there, but this is inside mm -hmm. the Cloister Garth. So we're looking back uh, at the inside of the uh, south range kitchen refectory area and the west wall and you can see a lot of uh, uh, put log put log holes there which would probably accommodate a um, there, there would have been a walkway uh, along the west wall to complete the square for perambulation for the mm. the cannons and um, just below where your arrow is now or your finger is now uh, Helen you can see a little the doorway coming in mm. to give access into that um, southwest corner of the of the cloister um so you know my best guess at the moment is that um this is what this is the area we're working in at tungland at the moment the equivalent area um and if we look at the next slide mm -hmm. helen i think just to sum up a bit so um here's the hypothesis is uh what we think we may have. We have then a west wall, but no west range. We've, we've got that plotted. We, we've found that and exposed that in the excavation. We've got a bit of the south range, the west end, that's it, down there. So that means we might have the cloister area. Mm. And if that's the case, then um, the Abbey Church would have been more or less within the, well, it would be within the churchyard area. And as I say, that um, that remnant of wall that forms part of the parish church, um, with its exterior plinth, that would be an outside wall of the of the abbey church. This is the hypothesis, as I say. Mm. Um, yeah, fascinating. And, uh, but I love the before we leave that. Yeah, no, go on, go on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we leave this slide, let me mention there's a interesting place name across in the uh, the Clacken of Tungland up there. It's Mickle Yet. Um, there used to be a Mickle Yet nursery and there used to be a, still a Mickle Yet cottage and there was a Mickle Yet farm in the past. 
and nickel yet um, should mean something like the big gate, the main gate. There's a nickel yet in Kakubri, which is uh, the the main town gate was the nickel yet, the big gate, the main gate. There's um, and so on. So um, what's that mean then? Well, if we if we remember that the uh, abbey was enclosed with a precinct wall in the 1430s by Abbot Harris, then there would have been some sort of gateway into it. Um, let's, let's say, for example, the Abbey Gate was in that, you know, in the higher ground to the west of the Abbey, um, and that the access, the main access in the medieval period to the Abbey actually was from the west. And it's interesting, you can see a, a, a track continuing uh, it's it's an overgrown you know farm track, not used now I don't think, but it, it continues uh, you know beyond the settlement today. And uh, what I have in mind is uh, if we look at um, Lanacost Lanacost Priory near Brampton uh, in Cumbria, there is the perhaps the Micklegate of Lanacost. Um, you haven't got anything of the precinct wall surviving, but you've got the gate. And looking through the gate, you can see the west wall. Of the um, of Lanacost Priory, uh, the west sorry the west yeah the west wall and the west uh, windows and gate uh, and doors of of Lanacross. So, um, I think um, we may have a similar uh, situation there. No evidence yet, apart from there's quite a bit of medieval masonry turning up uh, in that part of the of the village or the Clackham. Um, some medieval pottery as well. Um, so um, again, a hypothesis, but it would explain the place, the place name, the mm. big gate, the main gate, etc. And we do know that there wasn't a bridge across the Dee to give access to the Abbey site until 1720s. Uh, so quite possibly the access was, um, as I say, from the west, which would take you uh, to the Taff Valley on the other side of the the ridge uh, that forms Tongland. Um, the place named Tungland means the literally the tongue of land and it's the ridge of land between the the D which we can see in this picture and the Tarf on the other side uh, of it. Um, oh, well um, I mean it's fascinating isn't it? It, it? You know as a unashamed non-archaeologist you know I, I totally take your point that it is a hypothesis and that until we until you have all the evidence there's always room for more evidence coming to light, isn't yeah. there? But I think the combination of the digging and then the research and the analogous priories and the um, and the place names and the aerial photography, you know, it all stitches together into a really convincing hypothesis. Um, I would say. Yeah. Ah. I, I think, well, I feel we're, we're, we're you know we're, we're a bit further on than we were in in 2015 when we started. I think we've got. Yeah. Uh, We've got more evidence now, and and you know, there there will be more to to be gathered. I think we do have a um, you know better impression of the abbey's size. I think that's important. We can say well, it's probably not as big as Griber or Glenluce, but it's um, you know seventy five percent, three quarters of the size, perhaps. Um, we understand the uh, the archaeological history of the site. Yes, yes. Let's uh, let's look at this slide. So the area that we we think we're working in is. The area ringed there in the south uh, southwest corner of the uh, of the uh, cloister area, cloister garth or cloister yard. That's where I think we are, and you can see there's you know the water channel coming in there from the from the left and draining okay. through the buildings and then down into the river. Yeah. Um, so we we understand the uh, the structure, the sort of the, the depositional uh, structure of the site. We've got a better idea, I think, of its size, and we're beginning to get a um, well, at least we're coming up with a hypothesis for its layout, um, mm. which you know can be checked in the future. Mm. Um, that, that's really the bit. That's really the been. That was our objective. You know, what can we what can we do to try and get closer to the understanding of the layout of the site? Um, and of course, if you know where a the site is, that gives it hopefully some protection in future. Yeah. Should that ever area ever be affected by any any you know. Building works or or whatever, new drainage works going through. That we, it, it, it's it, it's not a scheduled site. It does feature on uh, Andy Nicholson's uh, historic environment record maintained by the council. So um, 
you know, it, as I say, it was known that the Abbey is somewhere in that area, but we're able to, you know, give a, a stronger indication of where it is. And uh, I think that surely must help give it some, some protection in the future and be an aid to future research. You know, if, if there was uh, the opportunity to, as I say, look at say the East Range, where we would expect to find the chapter house and all that. Uh, but as I say, that would require some major um, mechanical excavation to get through that overburden and down onto the archeology. span okay. well, I think it's just been a, I think it's just a fascinating um, undertaking a huge amount of commitment from yourself and from all the volunteers and a, an a amazing focus on what it is you want to achieve and a great addition to the historic environment record. So uh, I take my hat off to all of you. Um, we'll move on to some questions in a minute because uh, we've, got, we've got some great chat coming in. Um, I would just say um, if a little plug for Can You Dig It, our focus for this year, next year and the year after is, is the creation of self-directed teams. So if you've been inspired by David and the, and the team's work, then the next two years is really the time because we've got Claire and Tom and the Rathmel team on hand to, uh, to support you and help you and get those archaeological skills transferred. Um, so if you've got a particular question you wanted answered or a site that you're fascinated by, um, we were going to be working this summer and obviously we're not, but um, Historic Environment Scotland have been super flexible and supportive. So we've got next year and summer 2022 to, to work on things. So um, uh, we want our legacy to be self-directed teams like David's working away with the high level quality um, knowledge and technical skills to do it and do a good job. So um, I'll, I'll leave my plug there. <laughs> um, Claire, have we got some good questions coming through? I think we have. Yes, the chat's been quite busy, which is nice. So I hope you're ready, David. We've got some <laughs> <laughs> questions coming your way. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so first off, well, there's actually a few, so I'll just kind of go through them. Um, I know Elaine been, has been quite interested in the fact that you've got quite a few abbeys in a kind of small area. So you've got Soul Seat, Glenluce and Tongland. And she's kind of also asking why are the both orders so close together in a kind of small area? Is that right? Is that representing more than one order across those three? Yeah, uh, the um, <clears throat> you've got to you've got to look at the um, uh, Lords of Galloway, uh, Fergus, Lord of Galloway, the you know, the the, the uh, man who started the dynasty, if you like. He founded Dundrennan, and uh, you have. Uh, Alan, of course, at Tongland, you have uh, Alan's daughter, Deva Giller, the last of the, um, you know, one of the three girls, one of the three daughters, founding Sweetheart. So there's almost like a family tradition uh, of, of foundations. Uh, Alan's father, you know, Roland at Glen Luce as well. So um, this was a great, uh, this period was, you know, a great time for monastic foundations across, across Britain. Um, there were plenty of vocations if you like and so for example Caucasand their contingent when they came out would, would include an, an abbot and 12 canons um, now there must have been enough uh, personnel enough canons left at Caucasand to maintain that um, look at Dundrennan where you have um, a huge chapter house relatively speaking much bigger than say Dryborough accommodation for probably seating if you like for you know 50 to 60 monks at John Drennan so uh, this was the you know prime time for uh, new orders like um, the Cistercians and the uh, Premonstratensians and they, these were the two favoured orders uh, really by the um, amongst the the gallery family mm -hmm. and I think it, you've got a concentration around Kikubri as we can see uh, the Augustinian house at St Mary's Isle uh, later a Franciscan friary in uh, the Mott Bray, which I didn't put on the map, I've only put in the major sites, a nunnery at uh, Nun Mill uh, and so on, um, and a, a string of sites up the Nith Valley. Um, I, I think it's, again, we, we tend to think of the abbeys in the borders as being, well, abbeys in South Scotland being the border abbeys, but in fact if we look, um, you know, we had we had uh, plenty of examples ourselves, and what a shame we don't have more in the way of remains. You know, we have Glen Luce, of course, we have Dundrennan, Sweetheart, Whithorn, but uh, that's really only half the story. And um, mm. we just have to put it down to the efficiency of our um, later builders in, in robbing and quarrying the mm. the abbeys for their stone that uh, unfortunately have 
left us with the ruins we have, or the limited ruins we have. Upcycling. Very true. We also have Isla was asking because there was six, uh, I was hoping to avoid saying this word, Premonstratian <laughs> Abbey. And Isla was asking why, was there, why were most of them in Dumfries and Galloway? Is there a reason? Because they were set by different people, they were founded by different people, so it wasn't just a single person's choice. They take the name from Premontre in northern France, that was, that was the uh -huh. original foundation. Um, and as I say, they were also called the White Canons. The Cistercians also wore uh, white robes, they were, if you like, the White Monks, but the White Canons of Premontre, yeah. Uh -huh. And, and, and uh, any thoughts on what, if there's only six in the whole of Scotland, why are so many of them in Dumfries and Galloway? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, interesting. Well, I think I think there were, um, 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 yeah, there, 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 there are reasons for this, I'm sure, and uh, someone like Richard Oram, um, uh, very much a, a Galloway's medieval historian would be able to tell you more than I can and something to look into but uh, uh, yeah they, these are the two favorite uh, orders Cistercians or Premonstratensians. Um, one, one little theory uh, that's uh, been in my head for a little while is that the um, Tungland, um, the fishery at Tungland was was really very important. The Dokes of Tungland, um, very very valuable fishery in the 18th 19th centuries and in operation until the 20th century. Literally hundreds of salmon could be taken from the river um, uh, in the even in the early 20th century. And uh, knowing that at Cockersand uh, the cannons operated a fishery there, I just wonder if there's any connection any reason uh, or whether it was a factor that the abbey is based um, above the uh, fishery you know the docks almost certainly there'd be the same um, uh, salmon um, you know number of salmon coming up the river in the uh, early 13th century as there was in the early 19th or well, the 17th 18th and 19th centuries and I wonder if there's an economic um, angle here that um, you know Alan Lord of Gallery was quite keen to um, perhaps exploit the fishery skills that the uh, the canons had and uh, chose the Tungland site for them. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting one, you know, why is Dundrennan where it is and why is Tungland where it is? Uh, you know, they're, they're spreading them around nicely, either side of Kukubri, you might say. Um, but uh, it's just a theory. We've got no evidence so far. Uh, apart from the fact that Whithorn had, uh, had received a charter from Robert the, King Robert I that uh, gave them half the share of or half the right of fishing in the Dee. And um, could it be that the other half was shared by their Monstratensian colleagues at Tungland? You know, unfortunately, it will remain a hypothesis. Mm. I don't think there'll be any evidence. We've, we've found some fish bone, but as I say, we're not really into the, um, the medieval stratigraphy to to uncover pits and pits of salmon fish bones in the in the abbey that would that would clinch it i think yeah. salmon processing that was good david because that answered another question i think radinoff was asking would the cannons have used the bow of fish traps as a resource so that kind of answered that a little bit there they said um, i i th yeah i'm i've got no evidence but i think it's worth thinking about they would almost certainly use the the water the river for uh, for their mill Powering their mill. Um, again, you know, Tungland's got a long, a long history of uh, mills driven, you know, by the water power of the Dee. Um, and in fact, the, as I mentioned, a lot of the Abbey stone went to the building of uh, a paper mill, a, a potato mill, farina, fl a potato flour mill, corn mill uh, down at the um, down on, on the river there. So, mm -hmm. I think almost certainly they'd, they'd have a mill down there too. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a question from Ian. He would want. To, he was just asking that, given that the man's wood is up for sale, um, are you concerned about access or possible development in the site in the future? Uh, well, it's as I say, uh, it's that's a bit of an unknown. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're probably in in many ways we're close to achieving our objective, and I think um, we've probably. Uh, getting close to doing as much digging as we could have done on the site you know we we know where the main buildings are in the north end of the garden 
Uh, we've, we've had one or two trenches towards the south, as I mentioned, that uh, later road area, and um, that seems to cover quite um, significant occupation levels. So lots of charcoal burning, and in fact, a, um, a, a gaming token, very similar to the sort of surrounded Whitmore in the excavations of the Priory there. So we know that the areas around the main complex in monasteries were given over to all sorts of other functions, agricultural or the care of infirm or elderly uh, canons or monks, um, more, in, more of an informal layout. And, and that would be quite interesting to, to explore as well. It's, it's, it's parts of monastic sites which are not really looked at hard enough, perhaps. But um, yeah, but in terms of our original objectives, we're pretty close to um, coming to that now. So we'll see. We might be able to do another year next year, but we're um, in the six years we've, we've been digging. Um, we're doing pretty well. And the other consideration is that it, it, it's it's time to write all this up as well. You know, you, you can you can go. There comes a point when you've really got to sit down and report. And that's something which um, any project has to remember as as you know Claire you, you've got to design a project which of course includes the excavation or the survey but the design includes its publication there's no point digging uh, if you're not going to make the results available. Um, um, what plans have you got in place for that side of things David in the future? Um, well I'd hope to I'd hope to I'd, I've been doing annual reports interim reports for the Hunter Trust particularly uh, and of course Andy Nicholson uh, receives those and they're published, partly published in Discovery and Excavation Scotland and you'll find them on Canmore now as well. Um, but um, I'm, I, I probably uh, hope to publish in the transactions of the Dumfries and Galloway Natural History and Antiquarian Society, um, you know, within, within a couple of years of, of actually finishing the excavation. Mm -hmm. uh, because that takes time and there might be some fun money involved for specialist support but you know all these things as you know Claire, have got to be factored in when you before you begin a project you've got to design it from start to finish um and so on yeah no, that's yeah, that look forward to reading about that um yet there's still more questions i was going to say should we rattle through a few more because we've got uh, 10 minutes or so um, yep, yeah, that sounds perfect. Right. Joseph was asking um, regarding the perpendicular relation of the hypothetical Abbey Church and the, the current 1813 parish church. Is that found elsewhere and is it often? Yeah, that, that's um, it's interesting the way it's come out, isn't it? Um, it's, I, I've not seen any records um, or any, any uh, remarks, records, reports of any um, any abbey uh, foundations being found when they built the 19, 1813 church you might i suppose it's a bit it's a little bit early for the local newspapers but um there's no mention of it for example in the um, second statistical account of about what 1840s 1840s perhaps you might expect that there'd be somebody might have written or when we were digging the parish church we found the uh, you know, we found the, the early Abbey Church. Um, some antiquarians have speculated that the it does lie over the east end of the Abbey Church, the, the, the later parish church, and it looks as if they might be more or less right. Um, interestingly, um, uh, one of the uh, council team who maintained the churchyard and dig graves occasionally there has told me about a, a foundation, well, the, the foundations of a wall to the um, going down the slope to the to the east of the of the later of the 1813 parish church and that seems to have been quite substantial and uh, that could possibly be um i'm wondering whether that, that's part of the precinct wall or going around the site um so yeah it, it, it's um the sighting is a bit of a coincidence, I think. I don't think there was any decision to build the parish church over the mm. east end of the Abbey Church. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was there was anything left to see at that point. Mm -hmm. it just worked out that way. Um, okay, Jim has asked, um, it will be now impossible to find things in the graveyard. Um, however, since the south of the site is where the cloister and other buildings seem to be, could the existing graveyard date back to the time of the Priory? Mm. 
No. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, generally the earliest headstones uh, are in the, against the uh, west wall of the churchyard and uh, they get sort of later um, as you go east towards the river. And there's an extension that takes the churchyard down the slope towards the river now. Uh, that's where this wall I managed, this foundation wall I managed. Um, you'd normally expect the um, the burial ground to be um, around the east end of the church, so around the, the actual uh, chancel presbytery end or behind the, the chapter house, that sort of area, mm -hmm. um, rather mm -hmm. than to the north of the church. Mm -hmm. So I think look, look east rather than north, which is where you know most of the churchyard is today. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've seen that elsewhere, I think that kind of layout being behind the chapter house, that makes sense. Um, okay, another question, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> Donald has asked, now can you can you refer to the financial significance of Tunland in relation to the role of the possible banking centre? And is there a connection with the jeton, jettons discovered? That... Right, yeah. We know that at one point, I think in the 14th century, uh, Tungland was used as a sort of uh, the bank for uh, the collection of uh, papal taxation. So, so money that which has been collected for uh, Rome. And uh, I forget the name of the bishop involved now, but uh, Tungland was obviously considered secure enough to, uh, to, to, to be the collecting point uh, for that, uh, that taxation. Um, I didn't mention also that in 1455 it was the it was sort of taken over requisition by the the the, uh, the king King James uh, when Threve Castle was being besieged 1455. Again, it, I suppose it would be the nearest big bit of infrastructure to Threve Castle, uh, which could provide stabling and um, well, and we know for example that uh, the the the, uh, the royal the royal, um, the treasury actually paid compensation to the abbey for uh, for stabling for for grass and hay, presumably, and also for the care of injured um, soldiers from from the royal army, mm -hmm. who were cared for by the by the canons in the in the abbey. So there was, uh, yeah, it was. Um, you wouldn't think of it now, would you? Because it's there's so little to see on site and. Uh, a lot of people don't know it's there or was there, but in fact, it would have been a, a major site, major bit of, uh, say, structure, infrastructure uh, within within the stewardship, within Cucubrashire, you know, up until the um, 16th century, really, early 16th century. Oh. We've got one here right from right early on that we mustn't forget, Claire, mm -hmm. with uh, Elaine said, um, mm -hmm. uh, David, you said the White Cannons went as far west as, at Minigaff. Was there also an abbey by Dunraget at the Bal Baltanan Burn? Baltanan Burn? Uh, n well, uh, not that I know of. It could have been, but um, as far as I know, it was just, well, Soul Seat would be, I think, furthest west. Yeah, again, we don't know too much about Soul Seat. I think there's more in the way of, um, uh, there's more in the way of uh, earthworks, you know, some some evidence on the ground still of that but uh again that's a bit of a mystery as is uh hollywood or de connell north of dumfries um again that's a site which would um repay either some geophys geophysics or you know a little bit of supervised trial changing um just to understand those sites better how big were they where exactly were they what's you know what would we know of their size layout and uh how well did how do, how well does the archaeology survive in these sites, mm -hmm. and so on? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there was another question from Ayla. What would you like to find most in the future? So in the in this season, or where yeah, it would be your? <laughs> um, well, it, it's really um, we. I so say our, our work at this year is is confirming. Um, one the one of the north south what we think is of the kitchen walls that the the, the last slide I showed uh, where the wall was just appearing two weeks ago, but uh, further down that particular trench there is another wall which um, we weren't expecting which turned up last year and uh, you know the, there's either another building or it's an extension of the of that that kitchen room um, to to follow um, who knows it could it could be leading us further south into the garden. When it comes to it which would 
you know, possibly cause cause us to rethink our hypothesis entirely. Mm -hmm. um, the hypothesis is based on the assumption that the the abbey is aligned in the normal way, that the church is aligned east west. So as I say, Abbey Church to the north, um, cloister to the south. But if you go to Revo in 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 Yorkshire, you find no, it's not aligned that way. It's aligned. Um, I think north south uh, because that's the lie of the ground over the um, over the valley there. So, so it doesn't always have to be aligned in the normal Christian orientation east west. So um, you know my assumptions are based on on that. And um, mm -hmm. given the the nature of the ground at Tongland, um, it does slope fairly steeply from west down to east towards the river. And um, so you must imagine that. Maybe there are undercrofts. There's a certain amount of, um, you know, digging into the former ground to ground surface to build the abbey. Um, that may explain why we have this hollow at the north end of the garden. That it's actually a, a feature or, or a, 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 a result of the of the excavation of the site to build the abbey, um, and you know, subsequent removal of the structure has left a hole. Uh, which had to be filled in so um, yeah so we're getting closer but I wouldn't necessarily say we're we've got it spot on yet basically. Mm -hmm. Although talking of finds you'd like to find we have got so we've got some cheeky slides up your back pocket haven't you of an excellent find that you did find do you want to talk us through? Yes, share we, that? yeah yeah this is your five, uh, five minutes more that's right um yeah, well, this turned up uh, in really in demolition rubble uh, in in a trench last year, and um, I think we obviously turned up covered in covered in dirt soil, and uh, this is in fact. Can you see? It's it's a piece of workstone, and um, you might be able to see towards the top of the photograph that it's actually looks like a hinge. You've got a three segments three part hinge down the middle that's right and you've got pairs of rivets rivets i should say on either side there and then down at uh, in the foreground you've got a segment of a some sort of round feature there um we didn't really know what this was when it came out clearly a bit of work stone but if we looked at the next slide helen we can get a clue this is the um Effigy of Alexander Stuart, first of Buckham in Dunkeld Cathedral. So there he is in his armour. And I've put a circle around a piece of armour called the Van Brace, which is, covers the forearm. In fact, the name is for the, from the French Avant Bras, and it's just the anglicisation of that, Avant Bras Van Brace. It, so it's just the forearm piece. And um, you can see the hinges in this drawing um, and so on. And you can see the elbow guard, not as is a simple circle, but that's, that seems to be a more of a sort of flower type pattern. So uh, an interesting fragment, but again, um, thinking about it, 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 it tells us almost, I mean, but I think that it's a fragment from a, an effigy, a life-size effigy, uh, that was in the Abbey. Uh, we don't know who it is, but it, it's an indication of the status of Tungland Abbey, that it would have a, uh, an effigy, a monument of this quality. The workmanship is fantastic and it, it, there's a trace, still traces of red paint on our piece, but it's, it's not really eroded very much at all. And it would, the style of armour, I'm not an expert in armour, but from what I gather, we're probably looking at 1400s you know early 15th century um and uh so that would rule out the abbey's founder alan lord of galloway so so who is it is it one of the um is it one of the douglas family from threve possibly um so you know jurors out of this out on this but going back to the earlier question it'd be nice to find the um the head this year or a bit more of the a bit more of the effigy mm -hmm. Well, perfect. I think we might. I think we've managed. I think is that all the questions, Claire? 
I think I've caught most of them. There's maybe one or two. So I've just put up a wee, yes, if I did miss any questions, I'm very sorry, but please just get in touch through Can You Dig It on Facebook or Twitter or email Helen and um, yes, we'll pass them on to David. Because <laughs> yeah. we have a way of contacting him forever more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, David is in our, uh, in our contacts list. Um, what I would say, yes, Claire sort of mentioned it there, our, our Can You Dig It Facebook and Twitter is actually a great stream. I can say that because I don't do it. Claire does it, but it's a semi-continuous stream of heritage goodness into your inbox. So um, I would, if you're interested in this sort of thing, give them a like. There's so much fascinating local heritage around this Galloway mm -hmm. Glens area. Mm -hmm. um, and Claire and Tom and the Rathmell team have been doing a great job unearthing it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's at GGLP, the Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership, archaeology, or search for Can You Dig It, you'll find it. Um, the Galloway Glens, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram feed is also daily dose of uh, heritage related goodness mm -hmm. um if you are very if you are interested in this you want to take it further we're we're always open for new volunteers um at the moment because of covid restrictions obviously we've changed the program around quite a lot so we've got this ongoing program of online events that will be continuing for most of the year fortnightly we've got some great speakers lined up just like david um we've also got two projects on the go and um, one of them is called my canmore now the experts among you will know that Canmore is the historic environment record, national record. Um, it's very patchy for a lot of our areas. Um, and so we put together a kind of how to guide for how to go out and about on your own or with your family or in a small group, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, if, you have, if you go on my camera and look at your local sites, you'll be, I suspect, surprised at how little is in there. So we're really encouraging people to go out and fill in my Canmore um, with, the, with their data to help. We've, we're creating individual sheets for settlements. We've done Kakubri so far. We've done New Galloway. We're about to do Carstven, Claire? Yes, yes, Carstven yeah. is next month. Yep, yep, yep. But, um, so if you live there, we've got a little starter for 10. If you live somewhere else, then um, just go and have a look because it's fascinating. And the other thing we're doing is a survey of the milestones in the area. There's loads of milestones around the Galloway Glens and they have a long and interesting history again it's the sort of thing you can do with yourself with your bubble with your household mm -hmm. um just pop out and have a have a look um but it's all genuinely useful information that archaeology i have learned takes many many forms and all of this stuff is good stuff and just because we can't be digging this year in big groups doesn't mean we can't all be adding to the um national record which is quite exciting mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. well, i'll just say um thank you very much to david absolutely brilliant really fascinating and as I say I take my hat off to you and the team of volunteers for such a sustained effort over such a long time and such a high quality work so absolutely brilliant um, thank you Alan because it's important that, yeah. <laughs> I'll say thank you to our funders as well the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Historic Environment Scotland they, their funding means we can put all these on um, including the digs for free for you guys so um, that's very much appreciated and uh, yeah keep in touch we'd love to hear from you mm -hmm.